Are you guys ready for this fun-filled policy? We are. I am obviously ready. our fearless leader. Okay, so let's start with get this one out of the way. The um, the additional guidance on adult use of cannabis in the workplace. Yes. I don't. I, so I read through this. I don't think this is. I think this is more of an FYI. Yeah, because the only thing I I, I really saw with this was. I mean, you must have to get it because the Department of Labor is sending it all out. Yep. But I'm assuming they're going to have to address more with the document of does the, this does not address the medical use of cannabis. Down the line, they're probably going to have to. So we actually did get, so we didn't get official policy guidance, but we did get legal guidance on that. Mm -hmm. And we have been told by schools' attorneys, and this was the whole process was told, that we are not accepting at this time, we are not accepting that. Oh, I have a, I have a oh. prescription, so I can go and use marijuana during my my lunch period. Okay. No, not this time. But admittedly, they said it is a, a bit of a gray area right now because it is so new. Yeah, it is new, and uh, I'm sorry. It's um, they put on there, including where their employee has not adopted explicit policy. It's kind of hard, you know, mm -hmm. decrease or lessen the performance of it. That's. A scale that I don't know how anybody's gonna. I I look at this as the same as alcohol use, except for obviously the medical issue does cloud it. Yeah. Otherwise, it's the same as alcohol. You keep, you know because you're 21 or you're 31, doesn't mean you can go out and have a drink at lunch and then come exactly. back to the classroom. I, I really didn't think you'd have to have some kind of policy to actually. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing as I was reading through. Yep. Yes. Well, <laughs> off premises wouldn't matter either. Yeah, well, yeah, we already adopted. I pulled that one out there, yep. the smoking, tobacco, and cannabis, and all that on campus. So, it's, mm -hmm. um, the other thing about this is you are the one that up, uh, updates all the policies. Yes. Okay. So, yes, I am. And are you the only one on the contact list that can review the policies? It says at the end. Annual review of policy communication contact list. So when they do the annual review, they send Ashley and I all and the just, documents, okay. and then that's when we'll have the, the once a year meeting where we'll sit down and we'll say, okay, here are all the changes, okay. and we go through that. All right. Do we get the level one and level two? Yep. Okay. Yep. When we, when we did when we first redid the policy manual, um, when your predecessor was running it. Mm -hmm. It, it is more expensive to do the level two, but the problem is once you've done all the work to update the policy manual, if you don't do that, it's inevitable that you're going to start to fall behind. Yeah, because yeah. it said that, it kind of said that when it was doing the, the level two, it was kind of like a cleanup. Yes. I, I mean, so far, you now we've been at this for four years now between starting the process of updating it all, and then we've been in now, I believe it's either one or two cycles of maintenance. And our policies are all staying current, so what it, it is it is working. Mm -hmm. um, unlike places that you, I think it was one of these that said, you know, if you haven't updated your policy since two thousand, you got to go back and fix all this stuff. We don't have to worry about that anymore because all of our stuff has been updated and regularly is. Oh yeah, it's, it's actually to stay current and on top of everything. Uh, when are you going to put out your next policy? Um, I have been working that. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Zinn generally is the one who picks what I'm going to do. And then I write it from that, and she has been out since, well, in, in between breaks. <laughs> cool. There we go. All right. Okay, so any questions on that one, John? Nope. Um, the next one is the uh, professional growth and staff learning. <laughs> professional growth, so that is in this yeah, so that one right here, yep. Yeah. This here seemed to me to be just a language change. Yes. Um, and I did actually, I didn't bring it with me, but I did print off what we actually have right now. And it is it is what they said. It, yeah. It's simply adjusting terminology. Um, and also they added in, oh, is this the one where they, no, that's the other one. Um, you know, current for the profession, meeting and learning needs. Actually, look at what I found. Yep. Oh, what is it? Um, this is where that came from. <laughs> I know. I was like sitting there and I was like pawing through stuff. I'm like, oh, look at what I found. Um, let's see. 
The only thing on the second page is your district listing important revisions to policy. When I was looking through the policies and they were talking about the level one and level two, R6213, I didn't see, it still says development. Six, two. Yeah, see it's on the second page. Uh, I don't know if I, I can't pull that up because we're actually broadcasting on my computer right now. So I didn't know, that's why I asked you if we got both levels, level one and level two, because I hadn't seen the change for the 6213. I will double check, but I am fairly confident that we opted for the, the level two. Okay. Um, so I actually, pull, I have the actual policy, I pulled it out. Um, and you're right about, it's just wording. They did add, um, Video, video conferences, they did add that. And they did add to it the whole, what you guys have to do before September now, the professional learning plans. Correct. So that's all added on to the actual policy. Yes, before what, Michelle? What? What was the date you said before? September first. Because I was looking at the professional learning plan. That must be so that all the new new yeah. hires are going to be on board. Yep. I would assume. And um, I was looking to see how much you guys have to register every five years with 100 credits. Is that what you have to do? Um, it de so this gets really confusing. It depends, so it depends upon when you were hired. So for example, under my original teaching license, I would have been exempted. A lot of our teachers are. When I left teaching, became a principal, I then became, it became applicable to me. When I left principalship, became superintendent, it's no longer applicable to me. But anybody that we hire as a new teacher, and I would, I don't know the exact date, but it's, it, it dates to this 2000. So anybody who doesn't, didn't have their certification by then, it applies to, they have to have that hundred hours. Now the, okay. the interesting thing in that is we did set up within our computer system. So what we call my learning plan, which does a host of features for us. One of the things is professional development. So people register through that. I do the approvals, the building levels do the approvals through that. And it keeps track of their hours for them. Mm -hmm. That's a courtesy that the district provides. Under New York State regulations, we we do not get involved in maintaining their professional hours. Um, it just gets way too muddy. So when this first rolled out, and ever since then, and I've actually had this conversation this year with Ms. Collin, people need to, I always describe it as, if you go to a PD thing, even though it's logged on the computer, print off a little certificate, put it in your file folder. If the state, the state will never audit, Granville or your teacher's compliance with this, if they ever got around to it. When they first developed this, they said, oh, we're going to audit teachers. And obviously, a thousand and one events have taken place since then. There's been no audits. But the teacher would be the one who gets audited. I was going to say that. Correct. Okay. So it would fall on them to produce the documentation. Where it becomes complex, and if, if any teachers are listening right now, actually, it would be very good to hear. If you leave Granville, yes, it's recorded <laughs> all in that electronic system. That stays in Granville. We don't print it. We don't. You don't have access to it anymore. So before people leave, and I've asked Shelly, please let people know that if they're leaving and they've done professional hours. Print them before you leave because they're going to be unavailable to you. And we draw all schools, as far as I know, draw a pretty hard line on we're not maintaining these records because it could get really muddy really quickly. If, for example, if they ever did do audits, we were the one maintaining the records. Now we've accepted the responsibility. And when a teacher says that, hey, listen, I did X, Y, and Z courses, and we don't have a record of it, if we're keeping the records, all the fingers are going to point at us and, well, mm, well yeah. you lost my records. Yeah, see, we have to do a pharmacy. We have to do it. We have to keep our continuing ed up to date. And then when we are renewing our license, we have to like put in all the continuing ed. Mm -hmm. And each state is different. New York's three years, Vermont's two yeah. years. So, so. That's a hundred hours now. Yes, that's yeah. clock. Yes. Yeah, what, what's the what's the equivalent on um, like grad out grad credit like a three credit course? Does that do they equate that to hours too? I, there is a calculation, but I honestly don't know what it is. 
Now, when you guys, when we were going over, um, so do you guys give the CTLE when they're doing this too? Yep. And the, um, so we, we are set up here that things that we offer in-house, if the principals or I authorize that it qualifies as CTLE, we can, we can give hours for it. And again, we can have, mm -hmm. through this system, we can print certificates, you can do all that. So, for example, faculty meetings. If a faculty meeting is just informational, you know, make sure your grades are done on time, the buses are running late, try to get the kids out there earlier, not CTLE. If you're doing a professional development, like we are going to look at dealing with discipline in the classroom, that could count as CTLE hours. Okay, yeah, because you guys you actually put in there the time, the days you're putting on there. Yep. This, 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 yeah, that's been on, I mean, that's been yeah. our work. It's definitely getting significantly better. Um, mm -hmm. Just historically, because both of you are, are newer members. So when I arrived here, we were, we did a lot professional development over the years in Granville. Uh, pre, pre me, lots of professional development and, and for some pretty high dollars. People yeah. going to conferences all over the country, yeah. uh, some significant expenditures. Not, I'll be blunt, not a lot of results in a lot of cases to show that those expenditures were worthwhile expenditures. So we didn't come right out and say we're not doing professional development. Of course we are, but we're looking to have people do it in house, bring trainers here, bring people mm -hmm. back. You know, maybe we have a trainer come in three different times during the year. Instead of sending one person to California to a conference, that same money with airfare and hotels and everything else can be used to bring a trainer that can benefit a whole building worth of staff a couple of times a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we have a pretty much all of the funding for this. It's people going places, bringing trainers in. It's all done through grants now. Mm -hmm. So it's not coming directly out of district funds. You know, obviously things pop up, need to go to conference. It's a little bit skewed right now because in the past couple of years of COVID, we have intentionally really restricted where people are going. The you, one, run, you run it all through the most East Coast or probably any other. For the most part, for a lot of it. Yeah. Highly aidable anyhow, right? Yeah. So I think the one thing that yeah. I'm a little disappointed that we haven't been able to get off the ground, which was one of my goals when I got here, is we have a lot of people on staff that I truly believe are experts in things. You know, maybe that's classroom management, maybe it's curriculum development, maybe it's lesson planning, all those different things. And I've been putting out for years, and we continue to do so, if you want to teach a class, you want to offer professional development, you want to submit, this is what I want to teach to my colleagues, and I've got, we're not going to do it one-on-one, -on -one, but I've got five colleagues who would like to do three nights, they would like to do, let's just stick with the discipline thing, classroom management. Give us the lessons, give us what you want to do. I'll pay you to develop it. We'll pay you to deliver it and we'll pay them to attend it. We've had incredibly few takers on that, mm. which has been a little bit disappointing because that was one of the things, because I do think when you look at the staff, that we're not huge, but we're also not small. We have some people that are experts in give different areas within education. It's, why am I going to pay to send you down to BOCES to a training on classroom management when I have people here that are really, really good at classroom management, and they would be a resource that it's not just that one presentation, but you can stop by the room and say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with this. Can you still help me out? Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, for whatever reason, it hasn't taken off yet. Yeah, you know, that, I, I, being an ex-teacher, you know, I kind of get the idea maybe that's, they don't want to be looked at as the superintendent's teacher pad or something, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I, which shouldn't be the case, but. I looked at it as a way to make money. Yeah. You know, yeah. If somebody told me, hey, Tom, you know, you could teach a course. Just, and I didn't even put any, I said, just, we're not going to do one to one. You no. get five people. You tell me, listen, here's the curriculum. I want to do it for two weeks. Okay. I'll pay you. Um, should be FAS I'm on YouTube, shouldn't it? I would think it would count toward that. Yep. So, I mean, it, it is something we're still keeping in on. But the nice thing this year is, the administrators over the last two years really have taken a front role with the committees on forming that professional development plan for the year. Yeah, and I, it's mostly it, a lot of it COVID related with the, the mental health awareness and yeah. the trauma. Because when I was reading this, the policy, the first thing, and I'm like, I'm like, they're trying to stick the DEI in everything because I was looking at the cultural responses and reflective needs of the community. 
And I'm like, all right. So that's probably going to have to be added in on our additional courses to explore. Oh, I did have one other question. Um, after what happened, the mentoring program, that's probably going to be changed too. The learning plan. Remember the wordings of it? Remember when we voted for the mentoring program? No. All right, well. I thought it was going to be changed. No? I could be wrong. You mean for contractual language for mentors? Yes. yes. That'll be updated when that comes out again. Okay. So the, the, contract, su <laughs> the contract supersedes that anyway. Okay. So we'll follow the contract, and then when that's updated for next year, that language will get rolled. It just it struck me when I was like looking at the mentor and I'm like, something's going to change with that. I think yeah, it'll, it'll get updated when they do the new plan. All right. So anything else, Sean? No. And what I will do on this one, I will reach out to Erie One and find out about 6213, and I'll also confirm that we are, in fact, level two. Yeah, because I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's just changing the words, but. Pretty sure that's what we went with, but admittedly, it was quite a few years ago now. Do the attendance. So I, I did talk to Mrs. Mead today about this. Um, and I asked some questions in advance for our meeting of, you know, why the change? What are we doing here? And really, when you when you look at the current wording versus the wording that is suggested in the document that you have, it's a difference of about 45 minutes. Okay. Um, I think in the end, and I do actually have, and I, if you if you want it, I can go print it right now. I was having some printing issues. Actually, no, I can't print it right now because we're broadcasting from a computer. We were having printing issues. Jeremy's been working on my computer all day. But Mrs. Mead provided me with the, the tardies, the, the excused tardies versus the unexcused. And I can, I can quote it because we were discussing it. I think in the month of November, there were, and now that, so tardy is not COVID related. Absences get a little bit squirrely right now because of all the COVID stuff. I think there were 620 combined in November, 623 tardies. Of those, I would guess, not having it funny, approximately 70 of them might have been excused. The remainder really appeared on the chart that she provided me as unexcused. Um, so it's, it is definitely an issue. And I can say Mr. Logan, since he has been here, is spending a significant portion of his day just dealing with addressing the tardy situation. Um, is there any bigger percentage of senior high, seniors? Uh, I don't have it broken down that way. I think it's across the board, but I think just from my own experience having been a principal, the older you go, the higher that percentage gets. Um, so I said, why, why are we doing this? Obviously, we're doing this because we've got to have kids in school. The wording of it as it sits here is awkward at best more than 50 percent of the scheduled day or three and a quarter hours we just needed time yes it's hard to compute that i way. actually <laughs> i suggested to lisa now our start time is 7 55. i i think 10 30 is very generous mm -hmm. i would prefer although it's not on your document here and she would agree with me i would prefer 10 o'clock um i think that that is you know if you start at 7 55 to be here by 10 considering that most of your academic classes are in the beginning of the day. When you look at the 10 o'clock, the afternoon part, there's at least 40 minutes in and it's lunch anyway. Mm -hmm. So most kids don't have, I mean, I'm not saying that all kids, but that first two hours of the day are generally speaking, those are academic classes in there that you're missing. Is that three, three periods or two? Uh, it'd be oh, 40 minutes, yeah, it's getting close to three. Um, yeah, 10 o'clock would be a better, I mean, even if the kids are going to be tardy, they usually have an excuse, like if there's a doctor's appointment, dentist appointment. They're, they're and yeah, and any they're... medical stuff, those are, those are all exempt from this anyway. So if it's an excuse, we're not talking about, this is, this is the kid who just isn't coming into school. Yes. Um, and I, I don't honestly have a whole lot of sympathy for it. And I, I it's not, you know, if, if mom calls and say, hey, listen, we had a snowstorm, we, he slid off the driveway, that's excused. If 
if we find out that you know your car broke down on the way here that gets a little bit more dicey but parents generally will get involved in that but when you don't have a reason for being late to school you need to be on time and I, you know, I applaud a high school for addressing it at the same time yes we need to address it as school but parents need to address it right? you have an obligation to get your kid to school and if if and I, it does obviously get harder when they get older especially if they're driving and things like that but they have an obligation to be here on time yeah, I, well, and this is the time this is just she's having a problem with that the attendance attendance has been good i mean my kid uh, it's challenging it's it really is I, I would before i answer that question my gut would tell me no however before i answer that question we would need to disaggregate your covid related absences because remember we're telling yeah. kids you don't feel well stay home so that's kind of skewed everything and it's also hard <laughs> gotta bring my parent parent in here it's also hard when your student your kid goes to school early for homework club and you get a call at i think the calls go out at 9 9 30 something like that mm -hmm. and you're getting a call saying your kid's absent mm -hmm. like, i'm like um he was there at seven <laughs> And I called the school about his going to colleges too. I go, hey, he's going to see colleges. They're still on his absent. He's still absent for him. So it's it's really hard. Because I'm like, I'm like, Colin, you were at school, right? And he's like, Yeah, mom, why? Yeah, and I'm not I'm not gonna excuse that. That is generally although there have been some glitches in each school, there are every year that it's not running, and then all of a sudden parents say, Hey, listen, I keep getting recorded and we find out it's not running right the number one reason for that is teachers not taking attendance well the only thing is i can see is he said is attendance taken the first period is that it's taken it's... every period oh it is yes by law and that's that's from kindergarten i'm not sure about kindergarten but absolutely first grade but i think it's kindergarten as well through high school that switched quite a few years back and it was an accountability measure it was a it wasn't a big deal for middle schools and high schools because we worked on a bell schedule anyway and you were period one period two you had different kids at the attendance it was a huge shift i was in burn at the time and it was an enormous shift when elementary had to start doing that because now you know what you traditionally think of i'm with mrs jones from eight in the morning to two in the afternoon mrs jones now had period one for this period two for this, and she needed to take attendance for all that. So it's basically what we're accounting for is if kids are supposed to get X amount of minutes of English, that they're actually getting X amount of English minutes versus, well, Mrs. Jones really is not much of an English person, so Mrs. Jones really is just on social studies all day long. Now there's an accounting of what at least is supposed to be being done during those periods. So why did, so is, did I get the phone call because of the So you got period? the phone call, unless there was a glitch in the system, which can happen but is often not the case somebody in your son's schedule didn't take attendance and submit it to the office thereby he showed up as not being there thereby you got a call okay i mean i mean it, his first period is a study hall so he might not have been in the study hall. right and it, right so if 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 the study hall teacher and again this should not happen this way but if the study hall teacher says listen Colin, you're a good kid. You can go down to Makerspace and do your stuff. That's fine. But then that study hall teacher should be saying, Colin, you need to check in with me so I can get attendance. And then you can go to Makerspace. Do they, do they, so I think, do they electronically, at the beginning of class, they, cool. they, they electronically. So it's now, the same system that generates those calls. Now, do they, in addition to that, do teachers, the old days we used to have to keep it in a register as well? Is, that's a they don't need to double back they don't do that okay so that's a good so this thing. goes to a central now who's the person who's the person who who keeps track of all that centrally because i in. believe it's well i can tell you it's either heather or gretchen okay the assistant principal or the principal secretary is where that first comes to that triggers the calls and things like that yep i'm not sure which one or if that's a shared responsibility okay because now it makes sense to you, me, because, like I said, the progress report is really difficult. And I'm like sitting there and I'm like, I didn't know it was during every class because it's yeah. like, you're looking at it and I'm like, well, I don't understand. Why is it four here and three here that he was, you yeah. know, because sometimes you can get out. Right. Like, and it, it's it's taken class by class. So, oh, so what sorry. I would say is when you get that call, 
I mean, this puts it on you. You don't have to do it. Call the school right away. Say my kid's there. Oh, Some, I have. Somebody to. needs to take attendance. I have. Um, <laughs> call the principal. Call the principal and let the principal know that you're getting a phone call and you're pretty sure your kid's to school. Uh, I when, when are they supposed to submit? Like within the first five or ten minutes? Um, how do, how I would assume, I, can only, I don't know if there's an official rule just because I'm not in the building that much. I can tell you when I do observations, I notice it's almost in the beginning of the class. Yeah. Like kids are coming in, sitting down, teachers over the computer doing it. Yeah. And I'm sure that saying is pressed at that time. I know I was actually doing sponge activity. And it, that was, well, they yeah. were doing that. You were doing the attendance. So, I mean, Accidents happen, you know, something happens yeah. in the room, teacher forgets to do it, or they get teaching and all of a sudden they, they realize it later. The problem is in those first periods of the day, once that call goes out, you can't roll it back again. Mm -hmm. So if I had social studies class, fifth period, the calls have already gone out. So if I miss it, you only know it if you pull the attendance, or if I go in later and say, oh yeah, I forgot to do attendance. So seventh period, I went in and did fifth period attendance. It's not what we want to see done. However, it's probably not going to show up if it, you're in that first before those calls go out and you miss it. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. I get it now. No, I, I just had a question there on, on E1. It says if a student is removed from class or disciplinary room, reasons the student will be considered absent from that class. No, I, does that refer to the fact like they, they're, they're taken out of a class for one or two days or whatever? That's the situation? I would assume so. I, my question was, is, does, does that have anything to do? Let's say a kid comes in and right off the bat, he's a problem. And, he, and he, you send him out and is he absent for that period or not absent for that period? He would be coded as, I don't know what letters they use in the system, but he would be coded as absent but plugged to the office. Okay. So I don't, it does not, it should not count as a, you're not in class because we're the ones who took you out of class. Yeah. I think of an absence as you didn't come to my class. Yeah. I was, I was hung up on the disciplinary reasons. Uh, you, you, they... you cannot count. I, I am sure that it is that you are absent from the class for a disciplinary reason and that coding because legally we can't, you can't ding kids for absence for discipline. It's, I mean, it, it counts. It's in there, but it's coded differently yeah. than being absent because, for example, you just cut class. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay with the ten? Would you rather stay with the ten thirty? No, the ten's much better. Okay. Yeah, no, I like. It. All right. Most of the rest of it is pretty. Yeah. Every everything else is the policy as it stands right now. The, the time was the only change that she asked for. I just got a couple other questions. Sure. Uh, just just uh, some of the, uh, um, like student attendance and course credit, mm -hmm. that part as we, as we move through there. Um, my under, I, I don't know if it's changed over the years. Um, you can have an attendance policy perfectly and everybody is supposed to have one. I know where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> I figured you would. <laughs> And you know, pretty much it's ten percent, eighteen most places it is, and then you you're you could be looking at uh, denying course credit, uh, right? As far as that goes, um, and I get all that. Um, I'm a little hung up on you know a certain percentage of the student's final grade based on classroom participation and so forth. So obviously, if they're not there, they can't get correct. They can't get that piece. Um, I know that, but also you can't, am I correct that you can't deny your credit solely on the basis of attendance? In so words, all the, pretty much every school that I've ever worked in, ours too, that currently, yeah. put out the, you've seen them, the generic, listen, excessive absences yeah. could cost you credit in this course. Yeah. The, re, the legal reality of that is you cannot deny earned credit. So if I miss 70 days of your class and I still pass that class, I pass that class. Yep. You have no legal ability to deny you that credit, regardless of what we say about attendance. So realistically, and I have had this conversation as a principal, because, because you know, you get the conversation from teachers, he was in my class 70 times. Yep. Yeah. He's got 86. So what does that tell me about the class? Right. Right. right? So either he's a genius 
But we really need to look at what's going on in Crash because if he's missed that much time, how could he possibly have that grade? You know, it, those two things kind of have to line up. If the kid misses that much class, his grade should be reflecting that. Um, but in the end, you're you're absolutely correct. You know, I have been in that position where you'll have the teacher yelling and screaming that this is ridiculous that he's being given credit. This says that he'll be denied credit if he, he you know, is absent X number of days. Most of them say may be denied credit. Correct. There's a... <laughs> And, yeah, and when a letter comes out to you. <laughs> basically, you're, you're, you're having the conver awkward conversation with a teacher, and you're saying that he's got a passing grade. You can't take away his passing grade because of the attendance. He, he has earned the credit in your course. Yeah. And, and isn't it usually the copy is that they have, they have to make up the work that they're missed? You know, they have excessive absence, but they've, they've made up the work. They've, they've gone to the teacher. They've taken the test or whatever. That's how they, yes. they've got the average that ends up as you said correct I mean, and the teacher i assume can't refuse if a student wants to willingly make it up i mean i know some teachers will, you can will take no, you, the hard you, you, you can refuse that you can say listen i gave you a, and I'm, quite frankly when i was a teacher i did okay. i gave you a syllabus i gave you and i taught seniors i gave you a syllabus i gave you due dates i gave it to you on day one of class I let you know the assignment's coming up. You didn't turn it in. I don't take in late work. I'll take early work. Okay. And I actually have people that would yeah. do all their homework for the semester in the first two weeks, and they would have it all completed, and they would just hand it to me in when the assignment came in. But you can, you can deny makeup. Do I think it's a good practice? No. In reflection, no, I absolutely do not. Life happens. Kids' lives happen. Yeah. If they want to do the work, do the work. And I can say as a principal, I can remember many times when it came to the end of the year and the kid was tanking, Teacher, please give me all the assignments. I'm going to sit with them. And I can remember yeah. Fort Everett pulling kids and sitting in my office for three days straight. Yeah. You sit there and you do every one of those assignments. You're not leaving until they're done because if you do those assignments, you pass the class. Yeah. Um, but no, there is no legal obligation. I think it's a best practice kind of thing. Do we have? Oh, go ahead. The letter goes out with six absences. I would have to check. I'm not yeah, positive. I think it's six. I guess I have. <laughs> when they miss six. What? When they miss six. Yeah, there's a lot of it comes out. Yeah, like yes. they, there's there's incremental steps along yeah. the way. They they send out your your they are in danger because they've already missed this and yeah whatever the numbers are. Yeah. Well, I remember when it first. Came do we out. have do we have any issue in Granville? I know where I worked. It was an issue on different time. Parents taking kids out for extended vacations, and you know how do we handle? So I uh, work, work missed. I mean, we have some, definitely have some. Not as bad where I used. To, it was it was worse where I used to teach because it was a resort community and yeah. everybody worked in the summer. And when September came, everybody went on vacation, which was always awkward. Um, I would say it's not that bad, but does it go on? Yes, it does go on. I get it. We went to Washington, yeah. D.C. And I, <laughs> I don't, so again, I think you could have, I, I would have to check with Lisa. I'm not sure we have a set policy on that. I, That's think, what I, was I think each teacher would probably, my guess is we probably handle that on an individual basis. It, most of our teachers are pretty reasonable, and I think that they would give the work and say, hey, listen, if you can get the work done, get it to me and I'll count it. You know, I, I can see teachers being prickly at the same time, and I think I would be that if you were going to Disney World and you just missed my unit test, am I on an obligation to give you that unit test? Um, really not. I mean, you, you're, you're, it's not a legal absence. Right. You know, if, and I get it, your family decided they're going to go on vacation, they have a right to do that, and I think that from a legal standpoint, again, not a best practice, but a legal standpoint, teacher are probably pretty solid to say, you know what, it's an illegal absence, and I'm giving all the assignments, you're missing them, you're missing the test. That's your choice to go to Disney, it's not my choice. Um, I think you'd have a tough fight on that one, but I, I do believe that if, if I if I asked Lisa, I think I would get that most teachers would work with the students on that to get the work in. Yeah, I mean, we went to the teacher, they're young, they were very young. One thing I like about some some of that I've seen is, is that there's a, that the district has a policy that there's a specified time in which to make up the work. Mm -hmm. that it, you know, you don't let it, Going months or weeks. Some of that is covered 
In the it may not be the homework policy the that they've policy. adopted district wide. Yeah. Okay. I think some of that is in there. Well, that's if it is, that's correct. That's I'm not yeah. sure about the vacation piece, but I know that there is the, the amount piece. of time that you have to make up and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Because in particular, like in math, you know, where it's sequential, if, if if you don't get that taken care of right away, you can't move on to the next piece correct. and be successful. Uh -huh. You know, it's a little different with you know English or some history where you can read it. And, Time is not a bit. Okay. Anything and there isn't anything anymore, is there? About there, you, years, years ago, there were all kinds of things about you know you don't you you uh, you haven't passed the course, but you passed the regents, and you get. Is is there anything? Well, get me started on that. Oh, I'm just asking. So. <laughs> I have a. I have a personal feeling on that, and that is something I have I have discussed it with Mrs. Mead. And I honestly, if you ask me where does Granville fall on that, I would have to confirm it with her. Having taught, I personally believe, and I always did as a teacher, you pass the regents, you pass my course. Because regardless of the fact that I might want to set my standards above where the regents is at, or New York State Public School. In New York State, they say you need to know what's on this test to demonstrate proficiency and pass. You demonstrate proficiency and you pass. I am sure that a lot of teachers here in this building feel that, and I've heard this argument, I expect more than the regions. And there's a lot of merit to that, right? So the math, you've got enormous curves on those math exams. So proficiency is really not that high a bar. It's a little dirty secret. We don't tell anybody because... Well, the algebra is like, last time I saw it, it was like a 32, 34 point curve, something like that. Yeah. So really, you, if you just passed algebra, you didn't really pass. You passed with a massive curve. So I do see both sides to it. I think where I get really bothered by it, and it's on either side, kid gets a 90 on the regions. Let's say it's not even one of the ones that's massively curved. It's a social studies. They're not that curved, if at all. It's a 90 on the regions, it's a 50 in the class. Something's wrong there. Something in that, that yeah. curriculum is out of whack. And the reverse of that, right? Right. They tank the regions and they do outstanding in the class. Right. That's, That's just bad in another direction. I have right. no problem with that. I kind of have, <laughs> I have the feeling, I think the best way to handle it, I like that 10 point window. The, between your regions grade and regions courses, between your regions grade and your academic grade, 10 points somewhere in there, plus or minus, is a pretty comfortable zone that you're pretty well aligned with. I think it starts getting really squirrely when you have those other two extremes. Yeah. And it, it, something's gotta get better aligned. And I mean, I, admittedly, I think now moving in the superintendency, I used to really look at that. Like in Fort Edward as a principal, I really looked at, I, I would look at, I had spreadsheets of this is the course grade and this is the split and this is where I have to have a conversation that we're way out of whack here. Is there a pattern to it? Here I haven't, and quite frankly, in the last two years, in Mrs. Mead's defense, what do you count for each for? I mean, if right. we're even offering them. Yeah. Right. And that's the problem right now. We're looking at 3 8 testing is out the window. We are going to give it this year from a compliance standpoint. We have to. The state has to in order to receive their federal funds. It's mandated. It's the last year of the Common Core. It's next year we should be starting, God willing, we should be starting with the, the new testing series. So this is literally for compliance. It counts for nothing. Yeah. Um, as far as the regions go, now we didn't have the January. Right. The way things, I mean, I know things are going to go up and down for the remainder of the year, but it's still questionable. Will we have regions? Will we have all the regions? Will we have some of the regions in, in the end of the year? It's, it's that's why when we were looking at doing this data study, we're really not just looking at the 3.8 because you've got coming in now on three years of skewed data yeah. and any kind of that test standardized testing. No. But we can look at course enrollment. We can look at the number of credits kids are taking. We can look at how they're doing in those courses. And obviously we have courses that other schools don't, but every course is gonna have algebra. So how does our algebra stand up at a course level compared to somebody else's algebra? Yeah, just looking at the transcripts of columns. It was just like, I'm like, what is this? It's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's like the regions, it's like E, E, E. I'm like, oh. Yeah, it's, it's mind bogglingly concerning because kids are graduating. 
they are not graduating in the knowledge base that they should be graduating with. Right. And I'm not faulting anyone for that. Colleges are the same way. Kids are not graduating. I mean, I'm not so sure I would really want to be operated on by a med student that's gone through in the last two years. I, I mean, <laughs> let's sign up for that. And I fully intend when I start seeing young doctors say, when did you go through med school? Because it, it, people are doing the best they can. I'm not faulting yeah. them. But it doesn't work. And that, that's why I'm so adamant that we're staying in person. Well, the pharmacies, the, um, certain states are actually reducing the amount of years that you're going to get your uh, PharmD because there's such a shortage with everything. It's, it's, it's I'm like, everywhere. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do for, for educators. For administrators, yeah. for bus drivers, for support staff, it is a. It is a I, I, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, but I think in the next three years, all schools, all workplaces, is a tidal wave of problems that are coming towards us. And I think part of it is COVID, but that's not the whole thing. I think that we have an aging population. We have had lower than historic birth rates. We've got baby boomers moving through into retirement in droves now. And there's not enough people to replace them. And then you take fields like ours that are highly specialized, highly, you have to have a high degree of certification and training in order to do this. People are scratching their head and saying, why bother? Add in COVID, bureaucracy, state testing, evaluation systems, everything else. And, you know, no, I'm not going to bother. And I don't know what the heck we're going to do. I really don't. I, I think we have a major, major, I mean, every, Superintendent I've talked to feels the exact same way. We have a major crisis coming out. I don't know. We've built a system through legislative action that requires five kids in a class for special ed. Well, that's nice when you have a surplus of special ed like it used to be five mm -hmm. years ago. But when you can't find a special ed teacher and I can only have five kids in that class or six with a waiver, that's a huge problem. It's getting bigger and bigger. And bigger. Anything else on that? Do we, is, is the present situation with the state that the class average is really determined course credit, provided there is no regents? So right. if we had, a, if there were any kids, for example, that need to go as far as January and, and that would be their end time, their average is passing, then they've, they've, right. they've met the requirement right. that's, that's, that's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's an essence. And we'll be the same in June unless the Regis is, yeah. is I think you'll see I think you'll see an amended Regis schedule in June. I mean unless COVID goes away. I think you're gonna see they're gonna offer Can you imagine these kids coming back to take Regis? <laughs> I think you'll see the four core. Yeah. Again, I in the end that that's the number one reason I'm getting a little bit of pushback now on why aren't we going to why aren't we going to I can't wrap my head around the anomaly of, as educators, we're all openly admitting to communities, to the public, to the press, to everything else, remote doesn't work. Kids learn best in school, which is a fact. It is a fact. How could I possibly, unless shut down by the state, shut down by the county, literally have nobody that can teach these classes, okay, then we functionally you have to shut down. How could I go remote otherwise when we're openly saying remote didn't work? And kids have fallen behind. Then we need to do everything humanly possible to keep them in the classroom. Yes, exactly. The, the new governor, she just said that. She goes, she does not want any remote learning. She I doesn't. don't know. I, I have heard some grumbling since returning from break. I have no intention of going remote. None. That doesn't, and I, I put out to the principal staff, I said, you need to start talking to Brooke over every single day. I asked, I don't know if you were on that email, but I, I asked staff today, I said, it's not required to right. tell us yeah. if you're being tested. It's a courtesy so that we can advance plan because we may need to move people around to cover everything. I told the principal, I said, it may be a giant waste of effort, but if you know that, listen, I lose three more teachers, we got a problem, then if you have three teachers out getting tested, assume they're positive and plan the solution versus waiting for the results to come in two days later and then finding out, oh my God, I don't have a teacher You're scrambling, you're scrambling, yeah. Have, have we, has the district have any thought to the idea of perhaps to kind of get an idea where the kids are doing, making up like half a year's like a, a test? So they, they have it in the high school, but they do do those um, 
high ready benchmark testing and that they're actually in the elementary through the middle school and then their second round of that right now because i saw the notice go out the other day that the window is open to give the benchmark testing so that does test where where did you end last year where did you start this year where are you at right now and i ready is aligned with the state standards so it does give us an idea okay are, how far behind are yeah. we or if the kid legitimately started the year behind, which is likely. How much progress? Yeah, are we making ground or are we not making enough ground? So yeah. they, they are doing that. Regions are a little bit different from the high school. They, I don't believe they do that. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, as a math teacher, I'm thinking I could easily pick what I would cover in a half year and, and give a, a mock exam and, and see if the kids have. My, my cursory kind of, and, and remember, when I do my evaluations, it's primarily with our non tenured new teachers. But I've asked you, and some of them are, you know, they might be in the third year. Are the kids behind? What's going on? And I would say universally the elementary teachers feel that the kids are behind, that they fundamentally don't know the things that they should be knowing at this grade level, this time of the year. Um, they are seeing significantly more social issues of not knowing how to behave in class and getting up and walking around the room that they probably should have learned in kindergarten, but because kindergarten was largely remote or didn't exist because they stayed home, they don't know that now. So now in first grade, they're, you know, when they just feel like it, they get up and walk around the room where normally they might not do that. I think at the high school level, what we're seeing with a lot of this behavioral stuff is I don't have as much sympathy in the elementary because they were here every day last year. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, their teacher may have been in a different room. They had a TA in the room with them, and they were swapping back and forth. So it was less than ideal, but they were physically in the school. building. High schools, some of these kids are, this is the first year back into a regular, like this week, it's a five-day week. I mean, last year, that would have been a two or a, would have been a two-day week, right? So that's what they're used to. So I think some of the behaviors we're seeing are like, okay, like, last year, they've already, they've already physically put in this year, the duration that they would have been in the classroom all of last year. Yeah, and it's um, different too because you're in the classroom. You have no, I mean, so I, I remember walking by it, the, the computer with a roll remote and I'd be seeing kids like this. You'd see like at the top of their heads or something and it's like they're at home. It's like being on social media. Yes, yeah, it's it, and, and then it you're trying not, to like bring it back here. Is not, was not a functional system. It's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we're not gonna wind up on it. I mean, our numbers, as you saw from the list that have been coming out since Monday, it's a pretty steep curve. We're moving our way up here. Um, the ABCs, I told you. The kids don't know their ABCs when it comes to actions from consequences. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like when you're at home trying to learn and it's like, it's not the same. No, no, no. And it's, I just don't know how we're gonna catch up. We are gonna catch up. This is, and trust me, at this point in my career, I'm going to be a COVID superintendent, right? Yes, you are. So I, I didn't go into the superintendency to be a pandemic superintendent, but that's what I'm going to be. I had two years. Yep. COVID hits. I'm now at year five. Realistically, I'm going to retire in three to four years. It's going to take at least that. If we're being realistic, at least three years to catch if, if this ended in June, the next three years, they're not going to be astronomical progress. They're going to be repairing what the prior three years caused. If and I'm going to be completely blunt. If if we're lucky. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're saying catch up in three years. How do you know? Like you, we just talked about, there's another variant out there. Right. So right. Don't know so I'm saying it, and it's perfect crazy world. What you have everything to just disappears, and we go back to normal for next year. Three years at a minimum to get back to where we were three years ago. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't make progress in certain areas. It doesn't mean that we're gonna say, well, they're just stuck. we're gonna muddle along for the next year. No, we're not, it's gonna be a lot of hard work. But the idea that COVID is gonna end and all of a sudden we're gonna just skyrocket forward, it's not. Uh, and we're seeing that with the behaviors of the kids. We're seeing that with, the, I mean, the frustration of the staff. We're seeing that with the, I mean, people, myself included. I'm sure you as board members, we are burnt from this. You can manage a crisis for six months. You can manage a crisis for a year. 
three years of literally, I can say in my position, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, I am literally not sleeping at night because I'm waiting for what's going to come out from the state towards the end of this week, I should hope. And what that's going to involve of how are we going to shift what we're doing and keep this program moving forward. You can't do that for that long before it starts really taking its toll. And I think it is on everybody because yeah, you don't know what the hell's going to happen next. Oh my God, yeah, I can't believe it. I'm just happy. I'm just so happy that you're not school. <laughs> no, I'm just happy we've stayed open this long and just tell you, I'm like, I'm really proud of that. I look at it, the, the staying open piece, we have an educational responsibility but for my role. I also have to present the community. And every time we go remote, there are a percentage of people in this community that have to miss work. They don't have salary jobs and now don't get paid, which impacts their life. And that doesn't mean that we can't go, we won't go remote. We will go remote if we have to. But I firmly believe now, three years into this, we need to be pretty damn sure we don't have any other options because we are impacting people's lives. And we're not doing it to be malicious to them, but yeah. if you don't have a choice, great. But if you do have any other choice, we need to keep the kids in school. Because it doesn't, and keeping them home isn't really good. The remote's not working. And if you just, if they just stay home, it's not like, well, I, I did get some calls. Well, why don't you just close for a week, go remote for a week, and let the virus go away? That would be fine. If all the kids stayed locked in their homes, not visiting with other people, not going to somebody's house, not playing AAU, not going out to the park and playing basketball, if everybody literally just locked in their house for a week or two, that might have some merit, but it's never going to happen, especially this many years into it. I think mm -hmm. our community is done with this for the most part. I don't know why I like school. Yeah, <laughs> this is no way to live. No. Human beings are social people, and I, well, I don't know about that. But, um, well, I, mean, by and large, I mean, I mean, you, <laughs> but I mean, by and large, even, even I mean, I don't like crowds to begin with, and I don't like public to begin with, which is an odd job to be in, I know. But nonetheless, it is part of our character. Even going to a store, hiding behind a mask, when I reach to touch the little keypad thinking, am I going to get it now? That wears on you after a while. Uh, I'm going to get it now. Yes. Last thing out here, it's just in our obligation is to do an annual review of the attendance. Yes. By the board. Um, she gets us the usually they were given. We get an update every yeah. so often. Yeah, yeah. every the, so the often. I mean, it'd be nice, I think, maybe to have a, a summary since it says annually, you know, like a, a couple of weeks before. Sometimes the, when they're building reports, they usually give they, that. They have time. been adding in the building reports. There's a, yeah. that little blurb in there. Um, what we could do is at the end of the year, if you want that, we could do kind of a trend line of, okay, this is. Because you get you, you get your monthly report, but that's unless you're the one putting it all together, that's okay. Well, it's this month. Well, if you didn't remember what the prior months are, are we up? Are we down? Yeah. And then plot in a trip, an end of the year summation of that. But then you have to also add in or subtract the quarantines. And yeah, I, that technically yeah. any data that you have right now for attendance, absenteeism. I don't think it applies to targets. Because really, the quarantine business yeah. that really doesn't yeah. get there. Yeah. But for your attendance data right now, I could almost guarantee you it's fairly ugly, and I could tell you absolutely it's skewed. I mean, right now in the district, you got 53 kids mm -hmm. out on quarantine. So you would have to go if you're going to do it. You would absolutely have to go in and back out all the kids' quarantine ones and look at just actual absences versus a quarantine. And then I would say you're still skewed because. We're openly telling people, stay home. Stay, stay home. home. Where normally in every other year we'd say, listen, unless you're dying, come to school. <laughs> now it's if you have a sniffle, don't come to school. The other thing I like hearing, and we, and we get it from time to time, is you know kids that are in danger of not making it. I mean, you already know after two quarters that we've got X amount of kids not. Probably that's, the, that's the no surprises clause there, and that's Lisa is good at that with keeping you guys and myself. That hey, listen, and she's really good with doing yeah. everything possible to get them over the line. Yeah. Oh yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, mean, I, hear, I like hearing that. So the last thing I want to do is 
you we send you post graduation a graduation report and you say, <laughs> yeah. Well hold it here, Tom, you know, it's the whole year has gone by, you don't think she told us that you know we have a sixty percent graduation rate right now? That would be very problematic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, regular board meetings and rules. Um, I'm assuming they amended this uh, law section 103 um, because so much was going on at board meetings that wasn't really nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's also that public access. Yeah, the 24 hours. Too. Yeah. Um, As a non-board member, I did not have any issue with the wording, but I did have one thing that I wanted to make sure that I brought to your attention. Um, and I'm not sure it's a bad thing. However, it's definitely different than I think what we do. Um, and it is, hang on, it is. Your public participation at the board meetings is quite different than what Correct. A video conference, uh, public notice, uh, where was it? It was in the second part, wasn't it? The uh, yeah. yeah. They changed the wording, which I actually really did like the... Um, oh, yeah. The, instead of public expression, it's public comment, which yeah. parallels what we actually say. Yeah. But the part about public is not to to, permitted to discuss topics unrelated to district matters. I, I, I uh, underline that because, like I said, it's so different than what you got what was in the policy before. I, I mean, I think I th so. I think the first part is okay. Matters unrelated to the agenda. That's the one that got my attention. Or matters involving specific individuals. So definitely, we we may not say it, but we definitely would hear that. If I'm a parent and I want to come and complain about Mrs. Smith, and I use Mrs. Smith because we don't have Mrs. Smith, we would say this is not appropriate in public session, right. and you can I, speak I, with the board of executive session. We don't come out and say it, but we would definitely do that. Where I'm a little bit questioning whether the whole board would agree with this is stuff not on the agenda. On the latest agenda, because, like I said, that's that is not in here. Right, and I, I look at that. So think about the parent who came to public session. I think it was October, November. Yep. yep. That would, if this were in effect, that parent would not be able to give you that. Advice. And I don't know. In in that sense, then she felt like it needed to be brought to the board. And what you have in here, if it's not related to the agenda, it's actually, is, and it was that night, it was given out to the admins in order it will be brought to your attention. And that's what said in here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I don't know where a parent, if a parent wants to speak to us as a board, I don't know where else would they would have any recourse of yeah, I, bringing it there. My own opinion on this, I'm okay with the, I think, I think the public comment is okay. I think the changes delineating the involving specific individuals, I think coming right out and saying, listen, I'm seeing language harassing. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's appropriate. Yeah, that's... I would just cross out the matters unrelated to the agenda because I really think yeah. in that public session, yeah. you're right. That is the opportunity for somebody to come and say what they want. And the board can say, listen, we would like to hear more in executive session. They can say, have you talked to the principal? Have you talked to the superintendent? Thank you very much for your information. We'll get back to you. All that's appropriate, but I, I think you're a public board. Yes. I when you I say we I, don't want to hear what you say unless it's what we have on our agenda already, that's a little problematic. Yeah, I, that's the reason I underlined it. But, and then you have to tell me, um, because it's different than ours, then why, why are they saying, but will not require speakers identify themselves? So that was the other that was part B. We specifically asked people if you want to address the board that you identify yourself. Yep. I didn't see anything in this little precursor that said that that had to happen. Like, that, okay, you, you can't require people to identify themselves. I don't like that piece either because, okay, you're all from Granville. You might know exactly who you're talking to. Right. I might not. A board member might not. I, I don't think... I don't think it is unreasonable that if, if you're going to address the board, you identify who you are. I don't think so either, because I don't know if you're, if I don't know who you are, 
then well, I also don't even know how to address you. I yeah. say, thank you for the information. Hey, you. <laughs> and, and you don't know if they're a resident. Yeah. So, you know, and if, if they're not a resident, they shouldn't be there. Yeah, I didn't. I was like, why can't I ask them? Okay, All right, so we're going to admit so far, admit those two. The matter is unrelated, right? That's correct. The matter is unrelated, and uh, you don't know. have to give us your name. I mean, I, knowing our meetings, I can't imagine that if somebody raised their hand and said, I have something to say to the board, and, and the president were to say, well, can we please have your name? And they said, no, I can't imagine that. Well, then we don't want to hear from you. I think we would let them speak anyway. Yeah. But I think to put it right in policy, to kind of just set yourself up. It, yeah. yeah, it is. And like I said, this policy that we have is more comprehensive anyways, with more situations, mm -hmm. what it is. Um, and the last part um, is just beefing up what the president can do. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the president could always, already do. It gives you the strength to be able to say policy. Yes, exactly. Because the, um, the code of conduct is always, yep. and that's not in... That's not in your, our policy. The, the actual code of conduct? No. Yeah, the district code of conduct. So that's not in there. It's, I find that always interesting. Who, whose responsibility is it to, re, before you call law enforcement, whose responsibility <laughs> is it to make that first contact and make sure, try to get them out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that who, happens. Who, that happens. I. <laughs> it's me. Yeah, I, it's me. I think that happened. Mm. Yeah, I, this came about because there were so many problems at board meetings. Uh, yeah, there it says residence and uh, Yeah, residence. I knew it said something. Well, yeah. is, is, there, is there any obligation to allow a non resident? To, 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 to be? I don't well, know. I think you... In our our public meeting says, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I would say that in our case, we're a little bit unique also because you've got Vermont people. Yeah. If, although they are not residents, they certainly should be able to speak at our meetings. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. See, it says here in the first sentence, uh, since board meetings are held in public so that residents and other concerned individuals may observe the board. Like realistically, so if I live in Hartford, maybe I want to come and tell the board that your BOCI bus comes past my house every day in Hartford, going 100 miles an hour driving recklessly. The fact that I live in Hartford shouldn't preclude me from coming to the board to say, hey, listen, I think you need to be aware of this. Yeah, that's a good example. Because it's a public identity. Yeah. Yeah, so. That came up, I think it was, must have been my first year when we were doing all the stuff with Act 46. And some Vermont residents had come to the board and they, they expressed that they felt because they were Vermont students for tuition here, that there should be a person on the board that's a Vermont resident. And we explained that, listen, under New York State law, it doesn't work that way. You have to be the resident of the district in New York. And I think the point that was made at the time was, listen, you had every opportunity to come to a board. As a, as a parent in the district, you had every opportunity to come to the board, come to every single meeting, express the wishes of Vermont residents. Or if you want to, you know, you have one parent as your delegate that comes and sits in the audience and says, listen, we have a question as the Vermont parents, totally appropriate. Actually, they say um, public comment time is also for statements. Or concerns regarding topics not on the board agenda during these times, residents, district employees, interested members of the educational community, board members, see, I, I said my comment correctly the other night when I was saying, nice job on the track of pride, and others may comment on aspects of the district operations. 
I mean, that was everyone. That's our original policy. Yes, that's that. Oh, like I said, what they have there, ours is very large, more comprehensive. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want, th this is not. So these last parts. I, I do want that. That the that. So I think we. We can certainly go through and take our current policy and merge the two of them. Because when they were talking about this, this is all 1510 is all one policy. Correct. Thing. And that's all three of those are added in. We have a separate one on public participation, 1511. So do you, in our 1511, what do you... In looking, and again, I can't bring it up on my computer, but in looking at R1511, do you, do you want to just keep, we could take, are there pieces that are in 1511 that are already covered in the new 1510? Or is, would you like to keep all of 1511? I think keeping 1511. I, I think so too. Yeah, and, but adding, um, maybe, um, Adding the first paragraph, the board encourages courteous, respectful, and public comment. To? R 1511. All right, so we want to have the, this right here. I just want to get it right. This is to be added to 1511. Mm-hmm. And the last, okay. the last paragraph, so, you know, the it's written policy that, the police can get told. <laughs> this is a lot easier just to go. People want to know about participation. They don't want to have to read the rest of it necessarily. You know. Yeah. I you mean, this add. is more. I like this. And okay. I didn't know we could do this though. I didn't know. Cut and paste. No. Shut up. He's talking technology again. Um. <laughs> I didn't know we could ask questions of the people that are speaking in public session. I mean, when the... So I think that you can. I think that the general consensus, and I, and I know I've heard Audrey say it, is that you want, so it, it does happen. What you don't want to do is you don't want to take public comment and turn it into a discussion item. Right, because it's not on your agenda. Inevitably, as a board, you don't have all the information. Research has to be done. Parent, let's just take let's take an example. We'll go with the bus driver that's speeding through Harvard. So, you don't want to, as the board, undermine, in this case, the transportation director, who's going to have to do an investigation on this. So, when you start in a public meeting now, saying, "Okay, well," Mrs. Smith, thank you for presenting that to us. Where do you live? What time does the bus go by? And you now have that debate. You now are the board have now stepped all over the toes of the transportation director who's going to need to do that research. So I think the more that you ask as questions, I mean, certainly if you don't understand what's being saying, you can ask for a clarifier. But in my experience, most times you really don't want to turn that into a discussion. You're going to get it to be a lot more than three about, you know, your... <laughs> Correct. It, it, it's going to drag the whole conversation out. And I mean, as you saw, what were we talking about when I had to walk out the hall at that meeting? It started into discussion. There were a bunch of, it was October, oh, November. Yeah, it's special ed. So it started into a discussion and then somebody's hand went up and then somebody else had an idea and then somebody else had an idea. And now you've got kind of a, you've almost got a public forum going, yeah. which really you've got, you've got a group of administrators sitting in the middle like, okay, this isn't even accurate. And I not really comfortable with this. You've got the chance of names now getting mentioned. If you have a statement to make, make your statement. If I don't understand your statement, could you please explain that? Because I don't really understand what you're saying. But beyond that, you really want to, yeah, you don't want to turn it into a discussion. Or, if you really feel you do want to discuss, I think that this discussion is taking, your presentation is taking kind of a tone that we really need to have a more detailed discussion. We need to go into executive session to do that. And any board member can call that. Like, when a parent presents, maybe the board hasn't said anything, but you say, hey, listen, I, 
I think I know where you're going with this, and I would like to hear a little bit more. You have every right to say, I really think we need to go into executive session over this. Um, and also, when Audrey reads her spiel, is that, a pop, is that somewhere what, when she's going to report? I think that. I think that little thing, it's not policy. I think that comes from school boards. Okay. Like one of their guidance documents. I think okay. that's where that came from. Okay. The respectful, cordial kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Yes. No, okay. I, I like that. I was like, oh, wow, we have a big one. <laughs> All right. Oh. That'll get adjusted. And then the last one is sun safety. Sun safety. Tell us about sun safety. So as part of this grant, we have to have policy in place that says we'll support basically the intention of the grant. The intention of the grant is obviously skin cancer prevention, sun safety, which in light of pandemics right now, admittedly is not my primary focus. However, I also don't see anything that's really problematic about kids wearing hats and covering up and, you know, what I what I did have the conversation early on with this group was they, they were advocating that we have like basically almost like the hand sanitizer dispensers, but out on field areas for um, sunscreen dispensers. I'm a little more dicey on that. Honestly, I think that if a parent wants their child slathering themselves with sun sun lotion, you know, sun protection lotion, then pack a bottle of it. I, I think we're I'm not totally comfortable with that to be honest with you. But as far as putting up, you know, portable enclosures or kids wearing hats or sunglasses. You know, certainly a coach could encourage, hey, listen, it's going to be really hot up on the baseball field today. Strongly encourage you to wear sunscreen. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. No, I think that's a good idea. I, I just going to come in sprays now. So you should see me. I'm like, right. I'm a redhead. So. Right. I mean, you take them all the time, you know, on the sunburns we used to get. Oh my gosh. And it's God. years later that you find out. I mean, it's so, oh, yeah. it's so easy. Yeah, now I start seeing little spots popping. I'm like, oh yeah. yeah. That's why mom always said to put the sun lotion on. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I, I deal with this. <laughs> but yeah, sunscreen is so easy now. I mean, you're, you're encouraging them to wear hats. You're not required. Yeah. Dress codes, but can still specify things that can't be worn. But again, we're encouraging stuff outside. School administrators are assess physical education clothing to determine if they might be modified to better protect students. Our, our kids don't wear a school uniform for gym. So, I mean, you're wearing a t-shirt, you're wearing, I mean, you could certainly say to a kid, you know, maybe you want to wear long sleeve shirts, but I think that in our climate, when they are outside, I think that's a little unrealistic. Uh, they're allowed to wear sunglasses. I, I believe they are already. Yeah. Uh, student dress code may specify the um, type of sunglasses that are or are not permissible on campus. I don't think we would ever need to do that. I mean, certainly when you're indoors, you don't need to be wearing your sunglasses, and that's the only time I've ever heard anybody be concerned with it. Yeah, the, the, the one that one that's a toughie there is under the the third bullet under sunscreen. Physically unable to apply, maybe assisted by unlicensed. Personnel yeah, direct. so this one, this is their template, and I, this is, these are the, the second part is the ones that I told them I was uncomfortable with, so I'm not, I am okay with kids carrying over-the-counter sunscreen, for sure. Yeah. Uh, annually updated record that permission must be maintained by the school. You can always put the posters, especially in the locker room. Yeah, I'm not sure I really need, sunscreen, is that a medication? It's, well. Oh. Technically, I mean, yeah, I mean, if it is, it is. then especially some of them. All right, so I would say then you have to keep all of, if we're going to do this, you have to keep all of number one. <coughs> or you outright say we're not having anything to do with sunscreen whatsoever. Um, students will be allowed time and courage to apply sunscreen before going out. I think that one's fine. Yeah, I do. If you have number one, that one is certainly fine. I don't have that. Is it the bottom? Second bullet down on sunscreen. After my bracket. I don't have, don't have sunscreen. You're on the back of the page. We got two pages? I don't have oh. sunscreen. <laughs> you got the back side of what we don't have. Do you have, a, you have a signature at the bottom? That's why you didn't know about posters. Oh. Oh, <laughs> let me go make copies. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we might as well approve the entire policy. <laughs> I 
It didn't say one of two either. No. I would think so. We wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah, you red has you. No, actually, I can because I got the brown eyes. I don't have green. I do, but. Well, the one that really got me with that was, well, you know, Sean Edwards. Mm -hmm. All the years he taught some of them lessons. He just, he was terrible. He said so much. Oh my God. And he looks like, whenever you see him, he's just like dressed in black. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, he's been to Dartmouth Newman, you know, for the. He said his, he said his was the glare off the water. Yeah. 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 And it's just as bad on his feet, too. Yeah. No, I uh, I was trying to get out to the garden really early and I'm late. But the bugs. I never wore a hat when I was kid, but you know, since I don't live in the air. Anytime it's a golf course. Um can't go without. This will allow for a much more uh, complete policy. I was getting done. Okay, now I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. okay, so reading of okay so I can start from the beginning. Yeah. So they'd have to have a written permission for the car to have in. I definitely agree that under sunscreen bullet number three is a no-go yeah mm -hmm. I, I think without a question who the hell are unlicensed personnel i have no idea <laughs> is there a licensing for sunscreen application that's yeah you can't that's holding into i'm not comfortable with number two or the one after that either sunscreen must be used for the purpose of avoiding on overexposure to the sun not medicinal treatment of injury or illness. We're getting into a level there that's really, not, I don't think, our place. Not for medical treatment. What does that mean? Must be, must be used. They don't, they don't want it. Must be used. I'm assuming that what they're saying is not that you must use sunscreen, yeah. but it it can it can only be used for sun protection, not for some other medical purpose. I don't know what the other medical purpose is. I can't think of one, but I yeah, I don't like that either. Um, yeah, well, that's got me. Cannot be shared with other students. Parents are probably responsible for providing something for use at school. My personal opinion, I would prefer to just ditch the sunscreen section. I will. We're going to promote gonna be safety. We're going to tell you where clothes. Um, it's going to be impossible because <laughs> would Brooke have to keep track of the permission slips and everything else. Can you imagine that? I mean, cop drops. Well, you now, you, now you're notifying coaches that this one has sunscreen <laughs> this one yeah. doesn't have sunscreen And are they supposed to keep it in the, the with the inhalers? Yeah, I, I think this on the, I understand their reasoning because they want sun. It, obviously it is very safe for kids to be doing that. But I think that it, we're just going down the road. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go and I'd ditch the whole thing I think too. <coughs> All right, shade protection. You want water? Yeah, please. Don, you want one? All right, no, thank you. We are, so thank one you. of the big things in the grant we asked for is that shade protection stuff. Mm -hmm. I get it. I, I mean, that's reasonable over yep. the benches and stuff. That's, it gets, especially, you know, soccer fields are brutal. Yep. No, I think that's totally appropriate. We're actually just, so we are actually getting our bleacher order together i know it's been forever doing that and and, well i mean it's the back orders from the else we did finally get approval through the grant so that we have the money to do that um and there actually are there's a canopy seasonal canopy that goes over the bleachers oh nice yep yes because you're sitting in the sun especially the boys field sitting in the sun on the metal on um, <laughs> the metal bleachers I would ditch that last paragraph. As scheduling permits, outdoor activities yeah, will occur before 10 and 4. Uh, I think that's uh, going to be a little problematic. <coughs> Until we get the lights. Yeah. That is a whole different story. <laughs> and the turf. And the turf. 
<laughs> okay, district staff get a copy of this anyway because we notify them that it's updated. Certainly they can prove. I like that. Educators <laughs> will be allowed to provide education. That's different than required. Uh -huh. I'm okay with allowed. Yep. So like this program materials, this is kind of the stuff they also will give us. We will get curriculum and we'll get posters and mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Make a section in our health class about it. I think we can certainly comply with the communication from the district. In some way that will be meaningful and perhaps not followed, but at least meaningful to try. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it's just the thing. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I'm not okay with the next one. In addition, just to provide notice of this policy to all contracted partners, agencies, or community based organizations, I'm not. If you're youth football, that's that's wrong. As I don't have any oversight over that. I don't want any oversight over that. No. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I mean, yes, we absolutely could. You want to use our field? You're going to comply with this. But I don't think that that's really what we need to do. Okay, we revise. We we look at all of our policies anyway. Okay. We have to adopt the policy. So we would adopt this. So to be able to apply when you go to a, correct. So we could when you go to communication for district parents gardens relating to hats, sun protected clothing, sunscreen usage, you're just not going to say having it on per having it on the person. It just correct. Say. Kind of like an unsaid said. I think so. We can do two things with this. There's a there's an easy one and there's a little bit more complex. So if you adopt this as a policy on Monday, I'll just send her a copy of the policy with the date on it. Ashley will send some minutes. That way she's got it for her records. We're good to go. The other way is I can tell it, and I did have this conversation with her, and she's not against it, but I think I, the email that I got ironically this morning was a little bit more pointed. Um, I said, listen, I'm not really comfortable as policy. I'd rather do it just as an operational regulation, kind of for our regulation manual. And that would not require board approval. I think that she was a little under comfortable because she's like, okay, well, without board approval, now I'm going to need, you know, I'm going to need examples of how I can assure that this is being implemented. Which I get. Because if it's board policy, I, we have an obligation to follow it versus a regulation that we can say, yeah, we're just not doing that anymore. So she being she being the grant coordinator at okay. Fence Falls Hospital. So I mean, my preference would be, unless the board has an issue with it, my preference would be, I guess, in the end, it would be easier to just adopt this policy. And though it's a policy that's a very specific and unique thing that really has to do more with operations than it does policy. Because if you're talking about regulations, is that like the so that's the administrative like the, manual. The, yeah, like the, how, tick, the tick, how we do it. Tick form, the, those things, remember, we were going through and all those lists of, okay. Correct. So it's it's more the, the how. So in, in, if this were added to a regulation, we would put this in there, and then we would say, okay, well, coaches are going to be responsible too. Athletic director, which we'll still do with policy. Like, how is all this going to get implemented? It, being policy, it gives her the ability to go back to her grant folks at the state and say, look, their board has adopted this as official policy of the school district. They've ticked off their box they need to do. I think it's, in the end, I think it's probably easier to just do that. Yeah, and then if it's policy, then it's, you know, I know it's regulations that are going to be following it in too, but if it's policy, then it's like, okay, it's there. This is what they're doing. Correct. And if somebody says, well, why do you keep telling my kid to wear a hat? I don't want my kid to wear a hat. I want him to get a suntan. We're just following policy. Yes. Okay, we're, we're letting you know that the sun can be dangerous and it would be better if you're going to be out in the open sun in this day and age, cover up. Yes. 
and that's what you can fall back on to, well, this is what yep. this is yep. saying. And it will, it, it makes it easier for us because we can, I can just, I think she sent me this in a word, but I might be wrong. One way or the other, we get it modified out. We just put the dates on it, send her the minutes, and we're done. Mm -hmm. And then she's not going to have a problem with us the way we. She, so she sent this as a template, and she said I can modify, because I, for, flat out, I said, so there was, there's a part B to this whole thing as well. And it was an educational piece about. <coughs> human pampiloma virus and cervical this, that, and the other thing. And I said, listen, I said, I got enough irons in the fire and about getting that vaccine. And as soon as the word vaccine came out of her mouth, I'm like, listen, I'll work with you on the sun piece. I am not going anywhere near that. So I said, if they have to go together, this we might as well not continue this conversation because I said, I am not doing that. There's, I said, there is no way I'm going out to my community advocating for the human pampiloma virus vaccine. What, did we, what would we get free for that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to know. But nonetheless, so they were fine with that. And I said, I I believe, we'll see what she says. Okay. I okay. will send this to her in the morning just as a, a kind of a marked up copy. If she says that's not going to wash, we can come back. We don't. We won't do it. There's too month. much regulation. Right. I mean, there's a lot of work in that section of sunscreen. Just I told her in the conversation that I wasn't comfortable with the sunscreen dispensers. I'm not comfortable with a you have to. I'm okay with a we suggest. This whole sunscreen part is moved as far as I'm concerned into the you have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, because they they are drugs in there. Yeah. So I, I will send it in the morning. If she says that's not going to work, then I'll say then you're going to need to wait another month because I'll have to get back together with my committee again. We can't do it on Monday. Um, if she says this absolutely has to be in there, I'll say again, I'll bring it to the committee, but I think we may have a problem then. Okay, so all these are going to be on the agenda? Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll have to figure out how to work with Ashley on that. Um, in the sun won't shine for three months anyhow, I just know. I'm going to actually end this now. I get Because I want to... I got my, my.